Dr. Richard Axel won the 2004 Nobel Prize in Physiology. Um, he's done some extraordinary work in gene transfer techniques that allow introduction of any gene in, into any cell. It's allowed us to really be a forwardly moving in uh, all of the genetics work that we, we now read about. But he's begun to apply molecular biology to um, neuroscience. And um, that's turning out to be really fascinating. So he's going to talk to us about sense, or the C in it, um, and sensibility, the internal representations of the olfactory world. In other words, why you smell what you smell. Not why you smell, but why you are smell things. <laughs> and so I thank you for your thoughts, your data, uh, this provides me with ammunition when I return. And so um, I really am very pleased to have this opportunity. Uh, as, um, as a guest of uh, the Rosalind Franklin Society, I cannot help but uh, recall Rosalind of 500 years ago, the Elizabethan Rosalind of Shakespeare's uh, as you like it. Rosalind was a woman so fully realized by the subtlety of her thoughts, the complexity of her emotions, and the fullness of her character. Rosalind and the Rosalind Franklin Society have indeed so effectively attempted to subvert the limitations that society indeed does still impose on women, and your efforts to dis dissemble the remaining barriers that society still imposes on women in the arts and sciences are really uh, enormously appreciated. So thank you for this uh, opportunity. I'm going to talk about science. This, this is not a nose. It is a portrayal by the Belgian surrealist René Magritte of his own brain's representation of the external world. It is a vignette of image and reality locked in mutual cancellation. This question as to how the external world, physical reality, is represented in the brain is not only a source of creativity in art, but lies at the very core of philosophy, psychology, and neuroscience. This problem of how the external world is represented in the brain is, in fact, the problem of perception. And the problem of perception is an astonishing problem. How it is that the physical reality of the world can actually be recognized and represented by a brain. And I'd like to continue to, to, to use art to explain to you how I think about this problem. This very beautiful painting by Lucas Cronach depicts the Earth's first lovers, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden. 500 years later, the master of the zip, Barnett Newman, painted his own Adam and Eve. It is a painting that consists of disordered forms and colors and lines which bears no resemblance to the, rea to the reality of the image. It is an abstraction. And this is precisely what the brain has to do. That is, the physical world consists of discrete physical parameters, wavelengths of light, frequencies of sound, chemical structures that define smell and taste. 
And these physical parameters need somehow to be represented in a brain that consists solely of one thing, nerve cells, neurons. And neurons can only vary in their firing in two parameters, time and space. And so by definition, the brain must be abstracting the physical world. Got it? Let's consider the little we know about how this is done for the sense of smell. There's a nose. In the posterior recesses of the nose resides something called a sensory epithelium. The sensory epithelium consists of neurons, and the neurons have two processes. One, a specialized dendrite, which extends out into the world. And it is on this dendrite that, that resides the machinery to allow for the recognition of odors. And that causes an alteration in the um, electrical properties of the membrane which is then transmitted to the other process called an axon. And this axon and, uh, courses through the skull into the first relay station of the brain. That's called the olfactory bulb. So in your nose, you have a cell which, makes a, which recognizes odors and makes a direct connection between the external world and the brain. And so we can look at how odors are represented in the brain. And we do this by uh, a variety of different um, technologies. And I'm going to try and tell you about the technologies because of the excitement that's emerging today about new um, uh, ways to investigate <coughs> brain function, um, as well as genetic chicanery. Um, and what you see here is the epithelium um, in your nose. And remarkably, within the epithelium, there are nerve cells, and each nerve cell makes only one kind of receptor capable of recognizing odors. And you have, within your chromosome, 15, well, a 1,000 different receptors. And so if you have 20,000 genes, 5% of your chromosome is dedicated to the recognition of odors. <coughs> to our advantage, individual cells within the epithelium make only one kind of receptor. You have a thousand different kinds of receptors, and cells making one kind of receptor are randomly distributed in the epithelium of your nose. But if you follow them now back into the brain, this is the skull, this is the epithelium, what you see is that nerve cells that make one kind of receptor all converge on a fixed point. And nerve cells that make another kind of receptor converge on a different point. And so you have a thousand points in the first relay station in your brain, each receiving information from a fixed receptor. And those points maintain a position in space which is identical in all individuals in a species. And so it should, you now know how you can discriminate odors. An odor activates 50 receptors out of a thousand which in turn will activate 50 points in your brain. Those points are of defined spatial character, and every odor will therefore be defined by a different spatial pattern of neural activity. That's true, actually, because we can actually look at that using um, what's known as two-photon microscopy. We can image the activity of the brain 
all of you are familiar with imaging the activity uh, of functional MRI. This approach for imaging the activity of the brain is, has 10,000 times the spatial resolution and 1,000 times the sensitivity. So we can look quite um, closely at neural activity. And what you see in green is one of those points that in a mouse that's activated by fox urine. Mice don't like fox urine. And another set of four points activated by banana. Mice like banana. And so because this map is the same in every individual species, an experienced observer, not me, because I have students and fellows, I'm a, I'm a religious man, um, and it is written in the Talmud that the work of the righteous is done by others. Um, the, um, but an, exper an experienced observer can look down on the activity in the brain and can discern with reasonable accuracy the nature of the odor that the organism has encountered in the world. And that really is quite remarkable, but not really. And the reason it's not quite the explanation is that I look down on this discrete and reproducible spatial map with my eyes looking through a two-photon microscope. And a mouse does not have a two-photon microscope in his brain. So we're, we're beset with a far more serious problem. And that is, how does the brain look down on this map and discern how it is um, uh, interpreted? And so you have to move further. And we move further. Oh, well, are we getting too complex? Are we, we're OK, huh? Um, yeah, but I'm not. <laughs> so, um, and so what we do is we devise a technique to label the individual. These are these thousand loci. We devise a technique to label only one of the thousand loci and follow the information as it flows to multiple areas of the brain. And it's very complex. What you see here is the processes flowing from one glomerulus and the information pentafricates. It goes to five major areas. And I want to talk to you only about two. One area, which is called cortical amygdala, CoA, each one of these thousand points who's got spatial definition in the bulb projects to CoA with spatial definition. And so there is retention of a map in the cortical amygdala, but that map is completely transformed from the insular segregated map. And a second region that gets information is piriform cortex. This is the major sensory cortex for smell. In um, non-primates, it is the largest part of the mammalian brain. In primates, vis the visual brain is the largest part of our brain. And as you can see, or I'll show you more clearly here, there is spatial order in cortical amygdala, and there's dispersion in piriform cortex. This spatial order is gone in piriform cortex. What does this mean? If you retain spatial order, and the brain knows which of the thousand points have been activated, then you can use that information such that the activation of a fixed set of points leads to a fixed behavioral output. And so we, we reason that cortical amygdala indeed 
led to innate behavioral responses to odors. This dispersed character of piriform cortex, we reasoned, leads to learned behaviors. Most sensory input is not innate. It is learned. Most of what you experience in the world, whether it be the olfactory world or the visual world, has no meaning to you whatsoever without learning. So let's consider if this argument is correct. And so we can begin to now use the chicanery that you have um, been perhaps reading about um, to test this. And one very important um, innovation by um, Ed Boyden and Carl Dyseroth, among others, has been the ability to use um, um, molecules present in algae, in scum molds, um, uh, that allow you to manipulate the activity of neurons either to turn them on or turn them off at will with light in a spatially localized way. And this is extremely valuable. And so we do this. We take a brain and we put a molecule called channel redox uh, halo redoxin, which is a molecule that shuts neurons down in response to light. And we walk to the five areas that receive olfactory information, and we shut them down one by one. And what we observe is the only area which, if shut down, will eliminate innate behavior is indeed the cortical amygdala. So here's the innate behavior to fox urine. The animal runs away when it's exposed to fox urine. We put it in one quadrant of a large field, and the animal never goes there. If we shut down cortical amygdala, then the animal treats that quadrant like all other quadrants. And this is true for uh, uh, innately aversive, innately social, and innately sexual behaviors, we believe. That data is softer. Um, and another piece of chicanery, which is increasingly important, um, is something we and others have developed, and that is the ability to express these light-sensitive molecules that allow us to activate or inactivate neurons, the ability to express them in neurons that are activated by uh, a real stimulus. So we can give fox urine to an animal such that the only cells that will now express these manipulable um, uh, neural activators are those cells that are activated by the stimulus. And you can see this extremely powerful uh, genetic manipulation. Um, and when we do that in cortical amygdala, so that we express channel redoxin only in neurons responsive to fox urine, and then we come in and give light, the animal thinks that it has experienced fox urine and it runs away. And these experiments basically tell us that innate behavior is mediated by cortical, innate olfactory behavior is mediated by cortical amygdala, and moreover, we can demonstrate that the cells that lead to aversive behavior are, are spatially segregated and distinct from the cells that lead to appetitive behavior. Simple. Now we get complicated. Now we, we move into philosophy. 
What about learned behavior? Recall that the vast majority of odors you encounter in the world have no, um, have, uh, elicit no innate behavior. Your response to those odors is largely, if not completely, dependent upon experience. If I had wired those odors up into these innate pathways, then you would respond inappropriately to those behaviors. You need to respond to an unpredictable and variable world dependent upon your experience, and therefore learned responses to odors can't work by virtue of innate cortical circuits. You cannot impose bias. And indeed, any bias imposed by space is eliminated. This is the part of the brain responsible for learned olfactory behavior. It's a big part of the mouse brain, the olfactory cortex, the piriform cortex. And the spatial order that I showed you in the first relay, the bulb, and in cortical amygdala is discarded. It's thrown away. And neurons in cortical amygdala respond to odors in a distributive fashion. So this is again two photon uh, microscopy. And what you see is that neurons responsive to a red odor are intermixed with neurons responsive to a green, blue, or purple odor. It just uh, disperses in an intermingled fashion. And we know how this occurs. It occurs by virtue of the fact that we're now throwing away order and building a disordered system. Every one of these neurons is receiving random information from the nose. Random. How can the brain deal with randomness? And what that means is that if this were cortex and odor activated, uh, say, banana activated this ensemble of neurons in piriform cortex in one individual, it would activate a completely different ensemble in another individual. That already tells you that this representation has no meaning. It has absolutely no meaning. It's random, and it's different from individual to individual. And that is strange. And so what that means is that order must be imposed somehow on this representation. And we can actually show this is true by playing games. We can take a piriform cortex, and we can make our own representation using these light-activated molecules that are introduced with virus to assure that we generate a random representation. And we can shine light on a random representation, and there's no behavior whatsoever. But now if we pair that random representation with um, an aversive stimulus, and then come back and shine light on this representation, the animal will run away in response to light. We can pair it with an appetitive um, reward, and the animal will run towards it when you give it light, we can even make an animal believe, a male believe, that it is in the presence of a female by this kind of pairing. <coughs> we pair activation of a random ensemble with the presence of a female. The male, now in response to light, will exhibit social and sexual behaviors as if there were a female present. 
And so we can take the same ensemble of neurons activated by an odor and make that ensemble elicit any behavior depending upon experience. Got it? Because I don't. It's, um, this is how your brain works. Now, there is chicanery, uh, further games one can play, and what we can show without going through the details is how is this done? Well, we know that innate behaviors are encoded in cortical amygdala. And we know that odor identity and learn behaviors require piriform cortex. Piriform cortex sends a major output to cortical amygdala. And so these random representations in piriform cortex connect to the behavioral outputs mediated by cortical amygdala and learning experience dictates which of the multiple cortical amygdala outputs a given piriform representation will activate. And so this puts to bed the nature versus nurture controversy. There is an intimate relationship between learned behavior, the circuits mediating learned behavior, and the circuits mediating innate behavior. They share the same neural architecture at the level of the cortical amygdala. So what have I told you? I've told you, you don't have to believe me, I've told you, or I've suggested, that learned behaviors uh, innate behaviors are mediated by a circuit which goes from the nose to the bulb to the cortical amygdala and involves highly specialized insular spatially, spatial patterns of neural activity that are the consequence of what we call hardwired neural circuits that emerge through Darwinian selection through long periods of evolutionary time in response to predictive cues that existed over long periods of evolutionary time. Learned behaviors, on the other hand, result from a circuit in which the highly ordered spatial map of the bulb is discarded in piriform cortex to lead to a disordered array of neurons. And order is then restored by virtue of learning, by virtue of reinforcing the um, connections between piriform cortex and cortical amygdala. And so what I've told you is that this abstraction by Cy Twombly of Lita and the Swan, an image that hangs in MoMA in New York, clearly demonstrates to you the beautiful Lida being seduced by Zeus, who has been transformed into a swan. You don't see it? This is what an odor representation in the brain looks like. And this is indeed the image, Lida being seduced by Zeus who has been transformed into a swan. And we know now that that 
is Lita and the Swan, because you've learned it. Thank you. How many counts them? I, I mean, I've had 50 students, most women. And how many young investigators do you have working on them? Well, that's okay. <laughs> in my lab? Yeah. A dozen. A baker's dozen. <laughs> so if you can replicate the, the pattern of the learned uh, firing, which is, you said is random, in a second mouse, would it exhibit that will it have learned the same? No, the pattern doesn't mean anything. So the pattern doesn't, the pattern mean, doesn't anything. mean anything. You, it, 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 uh, what means something is experience. Any pattern will give any behavior. That behavior will be appropriate to history, experience, emotion, or well. But doesn't pattern turn into experience and experience turn into pattern? It has to. You're absolutely right, and that's what I tried to uh, inadequately describe. That is, disorder has to be ordered yes. by experience. Yes. And so the disorder of um, the cortex yes. is transformed into order by virtue of synapsing, of connecting with the ordered behavioral outputs, we believe, in cortical amygdala. It's gorgeous. And it's another reason listening to you is so obvious that there is no room for arrogance, because there's so much we don't know. And we are learning in the most amazing way. But here I'm asking a very... That hasn't stopped me. I know, I know, I know. You won your Nobel Prize, so that's all right. Now you can relax. That was in the past. <laughs> now you want it. Another one to begin. All right, so I have a very, un, uh, uh, what is the word, um, politically incorrect question. Mm -hmm. So when you said that you can make a male uh, mouse or rat think that they're in presence of a female, mouse. even when a um, female mouse, when they're not, would you think that it's possible to explain the complexity of homosexuality in the sense that, is it possible? Because, you know, I totally believe that it's the sense of smell that brings men and women together and men and men together or whatever in a very deep way and the question is would you believe that this could play a role is there anything to indicate that i think it's presumptuous of me to be able to think about the complexity of sexual behavior in humans um, in the context of mouse behavior uh, several years ago I was able, with one simple genetic uh, manipulation, to create uh, a bisexual mouse, a mouse that will m mount uh, males as frequently as females. Um, but um, uh, the relationship of that behavior um, to human behavior uh, is specious. Um, and any efforts to define genes that may, in fact, increase the probability of homosexuality uh, have failed uh, in, in humans. It's really so, so fascinating. I have two questions or points. One is that there's work in T. Gandhi, Toxoplasm Gandhi, mm -hmm. where yeah. the transmission of, of uh, parasites to, from cats to mice, that mice <laughs> that become infected are no longer fearful of cat urine. That would be an innate response, yet the, it, would, it, it has some learned aspects to it as well. So it's, one, it's really sort of an interesting conundrum and wondering whether anybody has done 
the neuroanatomy and you know functional yeah. anatomy. It's uh, that's one of the most fascinating observations uh, in in olfaction, and there is no biological basis for it that anyone has on Earth. We've considered looking at it actually, but I don't think. Looking to see whether the yeah. parasites are actually yeah. affecting yeah. one the piriform versus right. the cord. The other question is really, or comment is about pheromonal uh, perception and whether when it, are the are these areas uh, potentially activated in the perception of, of pheromones and uh, is or is there a completely different uh, foundation neuroanatomy? Yeah, um, so. Um, the word pheromone uh, has to be defined, uh, um, but there are molecules, I mean, classically, and I, this uh, definition is incorrect, uh, classically a pheromone is defined by uh, a molecule made by one member of a species that elicits an innate sexual social response by another member of the species. That's not uh, any longer correct. But in mice, there are two noses. Um, I talked about the main olfactory epithelium. Um, there is a second nose called the vomeronasal organ, which is in a discrete area that does not detect volatile uh, compounds, but non-volatile pheromones, largely. and this um, uh, is a second system that projects to a completely different part of the brain. Many years ago, Catherine Dulac in my lab identified these receptors, and she's taken that system and done extremely beautiful things with it. It's a completely different system, and all of the behaviors are innate. Helen? No, that was beautifully simple and complex. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, how, um, how much can one extrapolate or generalize this kind of sensory system to other sensory systems, such yeah. as taste and yeah. hearing, which are also innate and learned? Yeah, so taste is largely hardwired, but you can impose learning on it. Um, uh, virtually everything that activates a receptor in the tongue will lead to a hardwired behavior. That behavior, of course, as all of us know, having gotten ill by eating something, that behavior can be modified. But I actually think the, the principle of disordered representations returning to order is a general principle in the brain. Um, I think that uh, if you look up at the vast array, the millions of visual images we're all exposed to in this room, it's inconceivable that you could have wired that into your brain. It must be random. Nowhere in your brain is a square object represented by the firing of neurons in the form of a square. And recalling images is not like a video camera playing back that image. It has to be, has to be random, it would seem. The fact that Australians love Vegemite is an example of a learned. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, sorry, sir. Uh, just a quick question. And I know in humans, we, we have, um, gen genetically inherited differences in the concentration of our taste buds. We have the under tasters, the over tasters, sometimes called super tasters. Mm -hmm. So are their brains affected by the concentration of taste buds? Um, you know, these, I, I, I can't understand super tasters. You have super smellers too, and I've had conversations with them and we speak a completely different language. It, it seems, um, I was in Gross, the center of the perfume uh, industry, talking to 
the nose of the world, Rothnitsky. And frankly, I had no idea what he was talking about. So I, um, I, I don't know how it is that he can so readily discern the composition of that perfume. But thank you, and I apologize for speaking out of turn.